Ripple has a new filing in the SEC versus Ripple case, and Judge Torres provides an update on the proposed scheduling as we move forward through the month month of September. And we have an update from James K. Filing laying out the full timeline now as we move through the rest of the year. Gary Gensler tells founders and VCs in the crypto space that this field is not going to take off unless you have some trust, and he's here to give that to you. And finally, the VP of Payments for Ripple talks about how Ripple as a company can be a trusted partner for businesses to exchange and transfer value in a little more detail. And I think you'll find that interesting. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. I do listen to the comments, and so I'm no longer going to start my videos with the market update because, as I've been told many times, everyone is well aware of what the market's doing on a daily basis. So we're just going to jump right into the news. Let me know, though, in the comments below if the people in favor of uh, seeing a market update outnumber the people who are opposed. Then that way I get a better feel. Not too many people sticking up for it, though. So for the time being, I'm going to step away from that. And in the news today, we do have Ripple filing for similar reasons to what they've sent in before. Their opposition to the SEC's request to seal the identities of their proposed experts. We'll just dive into the letter. It's real short here. So this is from earlier today. This is recorded on September the 12th. That says, Dear Judge Torres, we write on behalf of Defendant Ripple Labs, uh, Brad Garlinghouse, and Christian Larson. In response to Plaintiff SEC's September 9th, 2022 letter requesting to seal those portions of the party's Daubert reply briefs that identified the SEC's proposed expert witnesses. If you missed that, I did a video uh, on all of what the SEC had to say back on the 9th when that first came out. So check it out if you missed it. But for the reasons set forth in defendant's prior submission relating to sealing, defendants oppose the SEC's request to seal the identities of its proposed experts in connection with the party's Daubert motions, including the party's reply briefs as further set forth in defendant's prior submission. The SEC has not made the necessary particular, 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 <laughs> Wow, tongue twisted today. Particularized demonstration of fact to establish that sealing is appropriate as to the identities of the proposed experts who are the subject of the Daubert motions submitted here, Andrew Serezny, and then of course you've got all the firms representing all the parties. So what does this mean? Well, just like what they've said before, and this is here from July the 25th, all the same reasons still apply. So rather than rehash that, they're just going to go ahead and submit this right now for Judge Torres to see. Again, they are opposed to what the SEC is saying here. So I'll link this down below if you want to see in more detail. But you can also check out that previous video on the channel page as well. Back when they first filed it, we went through that in full. Also, it's about three pages. Now, again, here from James K. Filing, we have the scheduling updates. So first things first, as of today, Judge Torres did uh, give the rubber stamp of approval on the September 8th proposal. So again, that was kind of at the end of the week last week where the parties came together saying that they wanted these dates and deadlines set up to lay out the rest of the uh, timeline for the case when it comes to filing of their motions and so on. So with that in mind, he's also updated his scheduling file here, which I'll link in the video description. This is one of the best references out there as far as timing and again updated as of September 12th. This now includes all those dates copied in just so you can follow along date by date. And you can see that uh, September 13th tomorrow is the next time there really is a date on the calendar. And then you've got the 15th later this week. And then it starts to be almost on a weekly basis uh, this month. And then end of October is sort of the next uh, big uh, set of dates. And then again, middle to end of November and then middle to end of December. The beginning of the months don't seem to be as heavy. So check that out if you've missed it. We've been through this schedule so many times. That's the only real change to it is the addition of these dates that Judge Torres did now approve. Now let's turn to Gary Gensler here. He sent a message to crypto startup founders and VCs saying that this field will not take off unless you have 
some trust. So last week, he spoke a lot at various forums. And then this week, he'll be testifying before Congress. I think it's Thursday morning. Uh, I tweeted it out when he posted it. So check it out if you uh, have the opportunity to listen in. I would normally stream it, but I'm not going to be able to do that this week. But uh, Gensler believes most cryptos should be regulated like securities and he's addressed Web3 founders and VCs at this NYC summit just last week talking about these very topics and why he thinks the industry is not going to make it without increased reg regulation and the building of trust among investors and the general public. So speaking at this uh, summit via a video call, and this again, it's a conference for startup founders and investors, he said he believed that most cryptos aside from Bitcoin should be regulated as securities under his agency, echoing things he said many times in the past. And we already know his stance as it pertains to digital assets, or as he calls them, digital asset securities. The SEC's recent litigation has indeed reflected this view in an insider trading case it brought against the former Coinbase product manager back in July. It asserted nine of the cryptos he traded were indeed securities. In Gensler's view, such increased regulation is critical to protect investors and moreover for crypto to gain wider adoption. Detroit would not have taken off without some traffic lights and cops on the beat, he said, directing his remarks toward founders and VCs in the audience. This field will not take off unless you have some trust. In an interview with Yahoo Finance about a month or so ago, he said the SEC would consider exempting crypto firms from certain rules to encourage more compliance. His remarks, of course, received a mixed reception during another panel. Now, Kevin Hartz, founder of the event ticketing company Eventbrite and co-founder of the venture firm A Asterisk Capital, said that significant regulation would likely restrict innovation in the industry. Well, we know that a lot of the policies, at least as they are currently being executed by the SEC, certainly seem to hamper uh, the innovation, but only time will tell. And it'll be very interesting on Thursday when we have a chance to hear more from Gary Gensler and what he has to say when he testifies before the Senate Banking Committee, if they're going to call him out on any of the things that he's done to this point, or if they'll let him continue to act as he will. So again, do keep that in mind. And I'll bring it back up here on the screen. Um, I didn't have it earlier, but here it is, this oversight of the US SEC. I'll pin it down in the video description. But uh, Gary Gensler, again, this is 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern on Thursday morning. Uh, Gary Gensler will be the witness, and he is supposed to be there live in person for this hearing. So uh, if anything happens in my schedule where I can uh, shuffle things around and stream this, I definitely will. But as of right now, don't count on me being able to do it. I'll link it in the video description, though. And once this goes live, it'll be at the link. So I'll link it down below. Now, the last thing I wanted to touch on here, VP of Payments for Ripple posted this earlier again today. Sony Joseph is the name. It's called Race to Exchange. It says here, and we'll go through it quickly. It's only about a page or so. As the world of crypto and traditional finance blends and crypto grows in importance as a vehicle for global value transfers and fiat itself, gets represented by digital avatars, be it as stable coins or CBDCs, the race to be the orchestrators of the global financial network has begun. By being crypto native, exchanges are taking the lead in this race and they will hold on to it unless traditional finance institutions accelerate their efforts and claim the title. Though exchanges have jumped ahead, traditional financial institutions have some strong advantages they can and should leverage to outpace their new competitors. Traditionally, banks have been the trusted institutions that consumers use to manage their accounts. They not only help consumers store, and inve store or invest their money, but they also act as trusted intermediaries to exchange and transfer value. Governments rely on banks to propagate central bank mon monetary policies. The explicit and implicit government guarantees allow consumers to trust their banks wholeheartedly, even if they have to pay a hefty fee for it. With each country, especially in emerging markets, becoming more or less an economic walled garden when it comes to cross-border money flows, governments made banks see entry points for capital flows via regulations and licenses. Historically, this has given big banks the upper hand in moving money across borders. Low competition and little incentive to innovate make the process more onerous, time-consuming, and expensive than it needs to be. 
The growth of crypto gave birth to exchanges, even though the spirit is non-custodial, not, not your keys, not your crypto. Uh, average customers want a custodial solution that helps them manage their keys and thereby manage their crypto. Exchanges cropped up to serve these needs and along the way provided an increasing number of value-added services going beyond storing crypto to savings and loan-type offerings with, for example, staking and yield opportunities. Since underlying crypto networks are geographically agnostic, with the exception of regulations and decentralized the technical plumbing to move money anywhere in the world in a low-cost 365, 24-7 and fast manner is built into the exchange offering. Ripple's ODL solution easily moves money from one country to another, tapping into a global network of exchanges to transfer fiat to crypto. Currently, banks and exchanges each own a separate type of customer relationship. Banks own fiat needs, and exchanges fulfill the crypto wants. Three things will blur this line. One, regulators are gradually starting to open up to crypto, allowing both banks and exchanges with the right set of licenses to offer more money movement and management services. Two, as more central banks start to experiment with CBDCs and stablecoins, become more pervasive, uh, digital representation of fiat will necessitate the need for crypto rails. And then three, lastly, but more importantly, users are starting to see both fiat and crypto as similar offerings when it comes to the storage and movement of value. Given the early entry into crypto, exchanges are better positioned to tap into these trends to become the banking services of the future and capture a bigger share of the user's financial transactions. Banks will need to work hard to navigate these changes given the legacy processes and infrastructure they rely on. However, banks can get ahead of the curve by leveraging their vantage point and adding crypto offerings to their user base. The ingrained relationship that banks have with the users, the time-tested depth of it, and the scale of their user base give them the edge. Along with that, banks offer necessary built-in consumer protections. Each of these components has allowed banks to establish trusted relationships with their customers, a trust which has faltered in some crypto-related companies in recent months given the current state of crypto. Nonetheless, customer demand for crypto isn't going away. Banks stand to benefit exponentially from adding crypto capabilities to their offerings. Many are already exploring how they can offer the ability for users to buy and sell crypto and how they can leverage crypto rails to move money across borders. Further down the line, cross-border payment rails will become even more decentralized and commoditized. Tarot on Lightning or Bitcoin is a good directional example of the shape of the future. And in that world, there will be many competing offerings as it becomes easier to build on top of the decentralized rails with differentiated customer experiences. RippleNet, with years of building cross-border payments atop crypto and fiat rails, stands to gain with its compelling customer experience. Essentially, in the long run, it's anyone's race, but the decentralized, decentralization of payment rails is leaning more tortoise than hare. Ripple is uniquely positioned to guide banks through this challenge, not just powering value transfer using Ripple's crypto-enabled payment solution, but also enabling banks to provide crypto offerings for their users through the Liquidity Hub solution. It's traditional finances game to win or lose. The race is on. So an interesting write-up here that kind of encompasses things that we're already well aware of. Banks tend to lag when it comes to the crypto space. You have some of these centralized exchanges that have already taken some significant steps with banks now trying to play a little bit of catch-up. It'll be interesting to see what kind of plans they have over the coming years to merge traditional and now decentralized finance options uh, to create the finance foundation for the future. Ripple, as we know, looks to be a player kind of in both in the offerings that they have for traditional businesses, banks, and governments, as well as some of the offerings that the XRP Ledger is able to provide to customers on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So let me know what you think. Do you expect to see the banks take some significant leaps? Will Gary Gensler put his foot in the door and uh, try and make sure that uh, he has a piece of the pie when it comes to the SEC having some sort of action here? to uh, regulate the space, maybe even stepping on the toes of some of his peer regulators. I'm curious to know what you think. I do truly appreciate your comments and thoughts. It helps drive the conversation and certainly does help me to try and improve things here on the channel. I hope you found some value here in the video. If you did, drop a like. It helps the channel a ton and keeps you informed. Hit that subscribe button so I can keep you up to date on all the latest news. 
Thank you so much for spending some time here with me. I do truly appreciate it. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day and start to the week. And I will see you in the next one.